Hello and welcome to Spear Medical Education. I'm Eric and today we're going to be looking at a trauma primary survey. So this is just your, your primary survey, your top to toe systematic assessment, uh, trying to find and find and treat immediately life threatening problems. So there are um, a couple of different systems out of there. The, the most common you'll see is the CABCDE uh, sort of system that we're using here. Um, there is also the uh, the March uh, sort of system as well. They both do the same thing. So we're just going to focus on CABCDE at the moment. But if there's um, if, if there's sort of genuine interest to uh, to have the March system explained, uh, I'm more than happy to to sort of make a video on that as well. Just drop us a comment and let us know. So the trauma primary survey. Um, the th the thoroughness of the assessment, so the the sort of steps that you that you take under each one of these headings, and the level of intervention that you're going to be able to carry out during the primary survey, is very dependent on the the clinical grade that you are. So somebody that uh, that is sort of new to to first aid and has got a basic sort of first aid understanding is going to be delivering a different sort of primary survey. And the interventions will be different in that primary survey when compared to, uh, for example, a, uh, a level eight uh, pre-hospital sort of medical consultant. Um, so it's it is dependent on your skill, uh, on your skill level and your current grade. Uh, what we're going to talk about at the moment, I'm trying to keep it very generalised at the moment on this one, just so you can, uh, so it can be appropriate for for sort of everybody and dip your toes into what a primary survey is. So. It should take no more than three to five minutes, realistically. Uh, that's including the interventions. That's including, say, for example, uh, putting a pelvic binder on during your circulation assessment. So, uh, so yeah, it is really, you know, it's, it's, it's not. This isn't something that should be taking forty minutes to complete. Um, we are trying to find and fix immediately life-threatening problems only. Okay. So, what's it for? Oh, there we go. So I've put it there. So it's to identify immediately life-threatening problems following trauma. It allows you to systematically find and fix problems by using an approach that prioritizes the most immediately life-threatening findings. Um, and like I said, it gives us a systematic approach. So it's a little bit strange. You know, you might there might be a patient sort of uh, with a lower limb fracture, uh, sort of lower leg fracture, and you see a bit of bone sticking out and a bit of bleeding. And that's the first thing that you see. You know, that, that's really easy to get distracted by and think that that's a big problem. But by getting distracted by the that by what looks quite grim, but in reality isn't a primary survey problem if it's not catastrophically bleeding, we can miss other sort of life threatening problems that's going to cause the patient harm. So this is about no matter what you see, no matter what bit of bone sticking out or where that knife sticking out or anything like that, we stop, take a breath, and start with at the top with catastrophic bleeding, and we work our way down with the patient. So catastrophic bleeding. What is it and what isn't it? So, you know, we are famously quite bad at predicting blood loss um, as pre-hospital care providers. And when we say a lot of blood, well, that's quite subjective. It depends how many type of these types of injuries have you seen before. If that's the most blood that you personally have ever seen, you might think it's a catastrophic bleed when, it, when it's not. Um so what we talk about is um, arterial blood. When we try and describe it, we try and describe it as arterial bleeding. Now, this guy's obviously lost his arm, so that's a nice, easy one. You can see a bit of bone sticking out there, and it's this bright red blood, which suggests that it's oxygenated, thus arterial blood, uh, rather than this this dark sort of uh, darker red blood, which suggests that it's, it's venous in nature. So that's what we talk about uh, traditionally. That it's just a, a lot of blood, usually bright red and, and arterial, and it's sort of pumping out rapidly. Um, with with the person's sort of heartbeat rather than sort of oozing like uh, what you'd expect with with venous damage. Now it doesn't mean that you can't have a venous catastrophic bleed. Um, I've seen sort of patients have quite dramatic sort of venous bleeds, particularly when they're not when they're taking medication that thins their blood. Um, but we are but we're just talking about lots and lots of blood, and traditionally, especially in trauma, it's bright red arterial blood following um, sort of a penetrating uh, sort of penetrating trauma that's um, damaged an artery or by sort of traumatic amputation uh, following following again a traumatic injury so some of the interventions we've got at this stage uh, at every level uh, regardless of what your grade is is uh, wound packing so that could be a hemostatic dressing so something like cellox or quick clot uh, hemcon or it could just be if you if that's not within your scope of practice it could be using just uh, the sort of rolled gauze um to, to to sort of pack into a wound in a junctional area and by junctional area we're meaning sort of the neck the sort of shoulder subclavian area uh, and the uh, the groin area we don't pack uh, anything into cavities so if we've got a big hole in the chest we don't start packing 
any sort of cellox or gauze into into places like that or sort of uh sort of holes in the abdomen if we can avoid it not to sort of start shoving rolls and rolls and rolls of this stuff into the abdomen when we can't directly identify where the bleed is coming from for limbs, we've got tourniquets. So there's different tourniquets out there. There's uh, the combat application tourniquet and the soft T, which are the two more common ones. And obviously, we're going to use these on limbs. And using the latest evidence-based guidelines from the Faculty of Pre-Hospital Care, we're going to be applying these as close to the point of amputation as possible. So for this person, we've got enough tissue below the joint. So we never apply them on, jo on the joint, but we've got enough tissue below the joint to apply it sort of two to three centimetres just above the uh, the actual amputation itself around the, a good piece of circumferential intact skin. If this was a uh, if this was closer to the elbow, for example, and the only way we could get this tourniquet on would be to apply it over the elbow, then we go higher and we put it up here on the upper arm. So we want to be applying it as, as close to the, uh, the, the injury as possible, even if it is over a double bone, because uh, we know that the evidence tells us that um, that it's just as effective. Cool. So that's catastrophic bleeding. So managing it with, oh, don't forget, obviously, you've got your, your sort of tourniquets and your, your dressings, uh, your, your sort of uh, hemostatic dressings, but don't forget the basics, you know, good pressure, elevation, and then get your uh, your sort of hemorrhage control device, your bleed control device on the patient. So we start off catastrophic bleeding. Once we've managed catastrophic bleeding, we're then going to look at the airway. So we're going to look at the patient's airway, um, check inside it. Once we've checked inside and we're happy that there's nothing in there, if there's anything solid, we're going to remove it. Uh, you can use different things. You can use McGill's forceps. You can use a pincer technique with your fingers if you feel really, really confident that you're not going to get your fingers bit off. Uh, you can scoop things out with a tongue depressor. A tongue depressor also just lets you, so a little wooden sort of tongue depressor also lets you just push the tongue down and visualize the back of the airway a little bit better. So it's always good to have them in your airway kit, but you can also use that to, to sort of clear the airway as well. Uh, and then if it's liquid, we can use postural drainage, so we can roll them on the side and let it drain out with gravity, or we can use things like suction um, So uh, for, for sort of managing that. So um, whether it, the clear part, really, our, our strategy is going to be based off of whether it's a, um, a solid obstruction or a liquid. And then that's going to guide whether we're, we're sort of trying to scoop it out, pincer it out, or whether we're going to use postural drainage or, um, or suction to manage it. And then finally, once we've checked it, we've cleared it, we're going to try and maintain it. So that could just be as straightforward as manual manoeuvres. So those manual manoeuvres could be head tilt, chin lift, your uh, your jaw thrust, for example. Uh, but you also might at this stage want to use things like nasopharyngeal airways, MPAs, or oropharyngeal airways, OPAs, uh, to uh, like sort of uh, devices that you stick into the, uh, the sort of patient's mouth um to uh to you know or nose to to sort of secure the airway so you've got the, the sort of plastic j-shaped tubes or the longer sort of um flexible nasopharyngeal airways i've got those the wrong way around aren't i um all the way around uh so yeah we're gonna sort of check the airway clear the airway um and then maintain it once we're happy with the airway we're then going to move on to our breathing assessment now there's lots and lots of different sort of things here um, there's different assessments depending on your clinical grades. I've, I've offered sort of three. We've got the RIBS A assessment, which is sort of more for your, your first responder, your firefighters, um, your, um, yeah, your, your sort of non-professionally qualified medical staff. So you've got RIBS A and then you've got uh, for, for sort of more qualified staff, you've got your FLAPS 12, which uh, there's a video. We've done a video on both RIBS A and FLAPS 12. If you want to look at those on our channel, that will explain them in a little bit more detail. And we haven't done a video on this yet, but this is another system which does it, it's rise and fall. It, it follows pretty much what FLAPS 12 is. It's just a different way of remembering them. Um, so it still has the 12 bit in there for the neck assessment, but then it's just a little bit more specific with the uh, the chest assessment. So you've got RIBS A flaps 12 or rise and fall depending on on what your your clinical grades are either way we're looking for abnormal breathing conditions and and sort of what we can do about it so depending on your uh, your clinical grade we can have we've got different interventions here we could be looking at uh, chest seals for example so if we've got an open pneumothorax we might be sticking chest seals on there we've got uh, decompression as an option so that could be either with a needle uh, or with a finger thoracostomy, depending on what your again, depending on your clinical grade. Uh, if we haven't got it on already, we can also be looking at oxygen, which is available to, to sort of most uh, pre-hospital care staff, regardless of, of what qualifications you've got. 
Uh, so they're just a couple of quick examples, but there's the, the, some of the interventions that we could possibly be thinking about during our breathing assessment. And obviously there'll, there'll be some more as well, depending on what we find, including uh, sort of advanced airway uh, sort of needs. So if you've got some front of neck airway issues that's causing airway compromise, you might need to consider some front of neck airway options. But either way, once we've managed breathing, we're going to move on to our circulation assessment. So circulation isn't like catastrophic bleeding. This is where we're trying to find less immediately life-threatening but still pretty serious bleeds. Um, primarily internal bleeding is what we're looking for at this stage. So we start a circulation, a circulation assessment by reassessing um, catastrophic bleeding. So right up here, we reassess for any catastrophic bleed. Not only is there a catastrophic bleed that we've missed or maybe underdiagnosed, but also if we've applied a tourniquet or we've applied any wound packing, we're just going to quickly check to make sure that they're still effective and they don't need anything sort of doing to them. Then we're going to check for pulses. So first thing we want to ask ourselves is, uh, are the pulses present? So have we got any pulses present? So we're going to check for a radial pulse first of all, so just down here at the wrist. If the radial's not present, we're then going to check for a femoral pulse, so a femoral pulse here. And if that one's absent, we're then going to check for a carotid pulse up here. So what this uh, gives us is an idea of, of what the patient's blood pressure is. Now, there is sort of conflict in the literature. There is, there is some that say, you know, if you don't have a radial pulse, your blood pressure must be below uh, 90 millimetres of mercury systolic. But actually, um, there's plenty of patients out there that, that, that sort of defy that and they'll have a higher blood pressure but no radial or a lower blood pressure and still maintain a radial. So it is just rather than attaching um, a, a direct blood pressure reading to, to these uh, radial femoral or uh, carotid uh, pulses being absent, it's better just to think about them as a, a sort of descend, uh, think of them in descending order of, of, of worseness of how sort of poor the patient's uh, perfusion is and how low their blood pressure would be. So uh, if the radial's absent, that's, you know, pretty, pretty bad. Uh, but if the, the femorals, if, the, if you then can't find a femoral, that's really bad. And if you can't find a carotid, well, then we're thinking, uh, obviously, we're going to have to start resuscitation with this patient. So, like, yeah, like I said, it is sort of like a little, um, a, a, a sort of a way of rapidly grading uh, how well their sort of circulation is at the moment. So then with pulses, we're going to look at uh, the quality of pulse. So whichever pulse we've managed to find is it sort of does it feel really strong under your finger is it really sort of pulsing under your finger or is it really weak and really thready and you have to you have to hold your finger there for quite some time to try and find that pulse and even then it's barely perceptible that again that's going to give us an idea about how well this patient's perfusing how well blood's getting around the body and then we're going to look at the uh, the rates and again there's a bit of conflict in the literature around what exactly is too fast in trauma so this is the, the sort of easiest consensus that I could come up with. So if the pulse rate's between uh, 50 to 100, that's, that's all right. We're not too worried about that. If the pulse rate is between 100 and 120, that's pretty bad. So they're, they're starting to compensate. Uh, but then if the pulse rate is above 120, then that's when we're starting to think, again, another sign of, of shock. Combined with things like an absent radial pulse, and a heart rate above 120, by putting those two things together, we're starting to think, wow, this, you know, this patient's definitely either lost a lot of blood before we've managed to get our catastrophic bleed uh, management in place, or they're, they're con they've got concealed bleeding. They're bleeding somewhere in the uh, in, in inside their body. So once we've uh, sort of checked our pulses and we've thought about our pulses, we're then going to move on to, to this step here, this blood on the floor and four more. So blood on the floor is just your reminder, if you haven't already, to reassess for your catastrophic bleeding, remembering that's new catastrophic bleeding, catastrophic bleeding that's, uh, that you've missed, or reassessing your interventions carried out during catastrophic bleed. The four more is where we're focusing solely on, um, on internal bleeding. So if we uh, talk about, first of all, the chest, so we're looking at the chest here. So number one, chest. And what we're looking for is pattern bruising, so uh, bruising developing with gravity. So if this patient's laid on their back, actually the first place that you're going to spot this bruising is around the flanks. So if you lift the armpits up and have a look at the sides of the chest, you might start to see bruising developing with gravity. So at the bottom, at the back of the chest, because they're laid on the back, starting to fill up, you might start to see bruising there. You'll have already assessed for hyper or hypo resonance if that's in your scope of practice at this stage. 
uh, which will again give you a bit of an idea um, in your breathing assessment whether there's potentially fluid there. But this is again another chance to, to check for that. Uh, next, we're going to be looking at the abdomen. So two for the abdomen. And again, we're going to palpate it. So we're going to get our hands on the abdomen. We're going to look for bruising. And then we're going to palpate feeling for any um, sort of rigidity, any pain when you're touching it. So is the patient trying to push you away or are they sort of grimacing when you're, when you're palpating on the abdomen? Uh, and is it distended? You know, is it starting to swell outwards that would suggest that there's uh, sort of free bleeding going on within the, within the abdomen? And then we've got the pelvis. So here we go. So we're going to check the pelvis. So um, it's difficult to explain it on, on this sort of video, I suppose, but we're going to be looking for, uh, are the iliac crests, so the hip bones, are they symmetrical? So if you put your thumbs on them, are they in the same place on both sides? We're looking for any fecal or urinary incontinence, so if they weed or pooed themselves. And then we're looking for any sort of external rotation or, sh or potential shortening, but usually external rotation of the uh, of the legs that would suggest that there's pelvic disruption going on but also think about the mechanism you know the patient come off a motorbike and struck their their sort of pelvis on the uh, the fuel tank of the motorbike or the handlebars as have come across are they complaining about pelvic pain if they're conscious etc so think about the mechanism as well and then number four um is uh, long bones so that is these ones not your lower limbs this isn't like a head to toe check for everything this is literally just checking um, the, the humerus on both sides and the femur on both sides, uh, feeling for any gross deformity, any massive bruising or swelling that suggests that they're bleeding into these cavities, uh, into cavities created by a fracture of these long bones. So some of the interventions that we might carry out uh, during the circulation assessment. Now, this is the I mean, circulation for me, I think, is the, the hardest one to remember because there's lots and lots to um, to sort of commit to memory here. When certainly when I've taught people face to face, this is where people struggle the most. But interventions wise, you know, we could be looking at, depending on your skill level, um, you might be looking at uh, sort of fluid resuscitation or blood products at this stage. Uh, regard, you know, sort of stepping down from that, uh, this is definitely where we would then be applying a pelvic binder if it was indicated. And again, looking at most likely traction splints as well in your circulation. So what we're not doing is putting little bandages on little cuts or putting bits of cling film on, on little burns and stuff like that. This is still primary survey territory. So this is still finding and fixing immediately life-threatening problems. Um, if you're having to administer fluid and blood at this stage, um, you know, this, this it's going to, that's going to sort of drag the time of your primary survey out massively. So there is some argument for just recognizing that you need to give fluid and blood, at the, blood during your circulation assessment and actually just spend the extra 30 seconds finishing your full primary survey, then gaining IV or IO access and giving fluid or blood. Uh, so there is some argument for that, actually, just finishing the primary survey and then gaining access uh, so it's all sort of boxed off that way. So disability. So D, uh, so we're nearly there. You'll be pleased to hear. So disability is just a head sweep, first of all. So we sweep the head, we get hands on the head, sweep the, uh, the, the front sides and the back of it, and we're feeling for any sort of boggy masses or deformity. We're uh, looking and feeling for mastoid bruising, so that's bruising behind the ears. We're looking for periorbital bruising, so bruising below the eyes and around the orbits of the eyes, which you can see there on this guy. And then cerebrospinal fluid, CSF fluid. So this is uh, sort of this yellow straw-like fluid that's coming out of the, uh, the ears and the nose that would suggest that there is some, some sort of... Uh, Sort of, uh, disruption with the cranial vault, the, the the sort of part of the skull where the brain's kept and fluid is leaking freely out of there, whether that's uh, cerebrospinal fluid or blood. Remembering that this bruising, this mastoid bruising and periorbital bruising, that's exactly what it is. It's blood flowing um, into sort of out of the, the skull and into uh, to other parts, uh, the, the sort of cranial vault, vault, sorry, and out into other parts of the skull. But these are the two places where it's most evident. So we're then going to check the uh, the patient's pupils. So are they equal and reactive to light? So this patient isn't. He's got one sort of blown and reactive pupil and then one pupil that responds normally. Now, this, again, is a just just like when we talk about tracheal deviation, when we do chest assessments being a preterminal sign. This, again, is quite a late stage sign in traumatic brain injury. It's a, it's a sign of sort of spinal cord compression. Um, and the, 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 the brain injury is really, really, really developed. You wouldn't expect to see this on somebody that's sort of laughing and joking and chatting away to you after hit, sort of taking a football to the head or anything. It's quite a severe sign and, and the patient will, will be quite poorly by this stage. 
And then we're going to check their response level. So there is the Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, I tend to do that in my secondary survey because it takes a little bit longer to think about. Uh, from a primary survey, we just need a quick, dirty assessment of how the patient's mentating, what their conscious level is like. So we look for, are they alert? Are they confused? Uh, are they responding only to voice? Are they responding only to pain? If, if they're none of those, then they are unresponsive. So that's what we're looking for at this stage. And that gives us an idea, again, of either they've got a brain injury or uh, their blood pressure is so low uh, that their brain isn't perfusing with oxygenated blood correctly uh, because of blood loss and it's starting to affect, you know, sort of the way the brain's being fueled. So, environment. Right, so there's a lot going on with this uh, this part of the slide, really, um, it, there's, with good reason. Uh, so we we have environment in primary survey. And I know traditionally, you know, throughout my career, it's sort of something that's been paid lip service to. It's just the uh, yeah environment, you know, just just put a blanket on them and and keep them warm. And it's the it, you know we spend the least amount of time talking about it. Well, actually, um, I've got some statistics here that you might find interesting. So 40, 50 percent, um, first of all, so 40, 50, but this is uh, based off of um, tra the Trauma Audit Research, Research Network, TARN, um, sort of data. So it's good quality evidence that's producing these statistics. And what we find is 40 to 50 percent of patients arrive in accident and emergency hypothermic. And we know that the colder you are, the, the more your blood struggles to clot. 25 to 30 percent of these patients um, uh, of trauma patients have uh, sort of increased mortality because they're hypothermic. So, so 25 to 30 percent of patients that are hypothermic are more likely to, to sort of die uh, in, in trauma. And then 80 percent of patients with a temperature below 34 degrees, uh, which isn't, you know, isn't ma isn't a massive drop. 80% of patients with temperature below 80, with a below 80% uh, yeah, of patients with a temperature below 34 degrees um, will go on to, to to die. You know they've got a um, they do not survive, which is incredible really. So 80% of patients with 34 with a temperature 34 degrees or less will die, which is just absolutely shocking. Two percent. Now I've put this figure on here because change my pen again. Um, so 2%, 2% of pay of all trauma patients, so all tra patients that trigger major trauma. So this isn't falling over and hurting your leg uh, playing football or anything like that. This is major trauma positive patients will have a, a C-spine injury uh, or a fracture, should I say. So C-spine fracture, 2% of all patients will have a C-spine fracture in major trauma. Of that 2%, 0.7 to 5% will have a spinal cord injury which is again is just incredible because for years and years and years we've just had this big big focus on managing patients uh, c spines and you know even if it means keeping a patient in a car that we're we're cutting them out of 20 minutes longer in the freezing cold in december that's okay because we're managing the c spine you know the roof needs to come off we need that good sort of lateral uh, extrication with the spinal board it doesn't matter that they're out in the cold 20 minutes longer as long as we manage that c spine that's what we've we've traditionally sort of how we've managed patients but actually when we look at this this tells us that patients are significantly more likely to die from being too cold uh, in trauma than actually have a spinal cord injury in the first place yet we let spinal cord injury dictate how how we extricate patients or how we move patients or how we treat patients so much when actually statistically you know they're so so unlikely to actually have a spinal cord injury and if we manage every patient with sort of big fluffy gloves on worried about their c-spine actually we're making them cold we're killing them through hypothermia instead accidental hypothermia or, or sort of a hypothermia that we've induced or, or exacerbated and um, similarly the statistics are significantly higher uh, for patients that have got sort of unstable pelvic fractures where they potentially sort of bleed, well, not potentially, where they can very easily bleed out into. Far more patients die each year through bleeding out into an unstable C uh, pelvic fracture than they do of a spinal cord injury that we've made worse. So again, we talk about C-spine, everything's C-spine. You're actually much more likely to die of hypothermia or um, a pelvic fracture than of a, of a spinal cord injury and trauma. So we need to get out of this mindset of uh, just really driving home C-spine and how important C-spine is. It's, it's, you know, we need to be sort of not letting that detract away from, from other sort of uh, patient care needs that's going to kill them quicker. And like I said, 
all that data is from Tarn, so it's a good source of quality information, not just sort of build down the pub, set it. So, um, talking very, very briefly about hypothermia, we'll do a, um, an episode on hypothermia specifically uh, sort of later on down the line, but at the moment, you, we'll just talk briefly about it. So you lose um, sort of heat through these four means here, evaporation, radiation, conduction, and convection. So evaporation is... Uh, usually uh, due to thermal, to, uh, sorry, um, sort of uh, thermal loss through uh, fluid contact. So that might be immersion in water, it might be sweat, or it might just be sort of blood covered or rain covered clothing. Uh, we lose uh, loads and loads of temperature where that fluid, that that liquid draws heat away from the body. So we can fix that by just removing wet clothing and getting them in something dry. We've then got radiation. So this is just that, that natural sort of uh, loss down a temperature gradient. So your heat being lost um, into, into atmospheric air that's colder than you are. So we need to create a barrier between you and the atmosphere to, to prevent that from happening. So with this, we, we use sort of blankets. We've then got conduction. So this is uh, heat lost through physical contact with, with another source, with another with another physical source, something hard that you can touch. So in this case, it's the ground. So I've, I've sort of coloured it in green here. So the patient's laid on the ground and they're losing lots and lots of heat through conduction. So they're laid on a cold ground. We can, we can fix that quite easily by just putting something beneath the casualty. We've then got convection, which is where we're losing heat through the movement of air, so in the, through the wind, for example. So you can see these grey lines sort of wiggling into the patient and then pulling the heat away. So for convec to manage convection, we need to shield them from the evident el elements, really. So again, if they're outside on a windy, exposed hill or they're in a sort of cut-up car that's the wind's blowing and it's really, really cold, we need to be getting them out of that vehicle as soon as possible and into sort of good hard shelter, so the back of the ambulance, for example, to manage that. So... Like I said, we'll talk about hypothermia in a bit more detail in a future episode, but uh, that's just a whistle-stop tour of it, really. And I've, I've deliberately spent a lot of time talking about environment because traditionally we don't spend a lot of time talking about environment. And actually, we know that we're, we're, that's actually killing a lot of our patients and we need to do something about that. So after the primary survey, we're going to look at the secondary survey. So this is literally, it doesn't need, there doesn't need to be a complicated system in place for this. It just is what it is. And that is a top-to-toe assessment to identify and treat things like breaks, non-catastrophic bleeds and burns so even though it might be a re really nasty circumferential burn all up the patient's right arm it looks really sort of horrible a patient screaming at you flesh is hanging off it's not a primary survey problem the primary survey problems are your your c a b c d e your catastrophic bleeds your airway compromises your, your serious chest sort of pathology that's going to kill the patient rapidly then we're going to worry about bleeds and breaks and burns and stuff like that. You know, we're, not, we're, we're only delaying looking at these by a couple of minutes that it takes to do our primary survey. So at this stage, we'll uh, we'll splint some breaks. We'll we'll put bandages on your non-catastrophic bleeds or tidy up the management of catastrophic bleeds uh, by putting things like uh, amputation dressings on and stuff like that. And we will manage any burns. We'll apply monitoring. So we'll get, if you've got access to a monitor, your, your sort of BP um, sort of machines, your, your SPO2 uh, probes and things like that, we'll attach all that. Um, we'll establish, or if you don't know how to do it or you're not allowed to do it, you'll assist with establishing uh, intravenous or intraosseous access, so sticking a needle into the vein or into the patient's bone. And then we'll package them for extrication. So we'll get them all packaged, ready to be moved onto the next level of care. So, again, another bit of a longer video, but hopefully it's been quite detailed and, and sort of answers any questions you've got around primary surveys. Uh, like I said, the literature out there is, is conflicted at times. Um, this is a combination of the sort of best literature that I can find and experience from my own practice uh, that, that's sort of all been put together to try and help you out with your pri understand your primary surveys. And like I said, some of the stuff in here may not be appropriate to your skill level, but, um, but most of it should be appropriate to all. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you found the video useful, give us a like and a subscribe and uh, look forward to more content from Spear Medical. Thank you.